Good morning. So good to see all of you and you're here. And how many of you come with a sense of expectation? How many of you believe that God can do anything but fail? There's no failure in God. How many of you know that God is not intimidated by your circumstance? When Jesus got up, he says he got up with all power in his hand. He didn't say some power. He says, all power is in his hands. Today is a great day, amen? Amen. It's a great day because God touched you with the finger of love and you're here, amen? Amen. It's a great day because I believe God's presence is right here and I believe that God is going to meet your need. I pray today that you would let it go. Whatever it is, you would let it go. And let God. Let it go and let God. Amen. Amen. Today we're having a joint service, and uh, let's give God a hand clap of praise for that. So you've got three pastors in full effect. How about it? So Jason will, Jason Elmore will be leading us from Asbury, Ron White will be leading us from um, Providence, and so will I. And we've got Janet Watts and Linda Collins. Oh, my goodness. Don't you already feel that God's got something great in store for you? Can you feel it? Amen. My wife just showed up, so it must be time to start the service. Can I sleep on somebody's couch, anybody? But today, um, I want us to sing happy birthday to my wife, uh, Natalia, but also Mae Clark. Mae Clark, I know you're watching us, and we love you so much, and we miss you tremendously, and we pray a blessing upon you. But I want to say happy birthday to all the November birthdays, because I don't want to miss anybody and somebody could pinch me after the service is over and say, you know you didn't mention, okay? So we want to celebrate. Who is it? Shirley. Shirley, yes. So Shirley Collins, wonderful. (laughs) Shirley Collins, we love you. And um, you do a good job at staying out of trouble, though. You really do. You really, 
do a good job at staying on track. So we, we, we love you. And um, Shirley, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question most men wouldn't ask. How old are you? 39. Again. 39. Again. Okay. Okay. Because my mother was like 55 for five years, okay? Okay, so maybe you're going to be 39 again and again. So we just, we just thank God. But I wanted to say that you are so active and so involved in this church, and you're always here giving of your time and of your energy. And this is the kind of members we should celebrate. So let's give God a hand clap of praise. So they want me to cue y'all for a happy birthday, okay? All right, so we're gonna, happy birthday to Natalia, to May Clark, and to Shirley Collins. Okay, y'all got it? All right, we're gonna try to do that in one breath, okay? All right, we're ready. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Natalia, May Clark, and Shirley Collins. Happy birthday to you, and many more. I think that's it from me. Ron, would you come and lead us? And now, church, if you would please stand as you're able for our call to worship. What joy it is to have you here today. Welcome to this place in which God will ease your burdens and celebrate your joys with you. We Whatever has happened this week in your life, know that God is with you and offering you peace, rest, and blessing. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord, we have come to you this day bringing all that we have, our lives, our hopes, and dreams, our fears, and our sorrows. We place these before you in faith and hope, knowing that no matter what has happened, you are with us and blessing us. Open our hearts to receive your words and your spirit that we may find healing and comfort. Open our lives to the wondrous possibilities for service and joy that you offer to us. Ease our minds and spirits that we may hear the words of encouragement and the words of peace this day. It is all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Please stand if you're able. Open your hymnals up to page 393, Spirit of the Living God.
may be seated. Praise to God who comes in judgment. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all gods of all peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
It's all right to say amen. I'm excited today because um, we have a joint service today, but I just wanted to give God praise and thanks for Asbury Church, and they have been with us, and it's just been a beautiful partnership. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise for it? And when we talked about doing a combined service, um, Jason is always so willing. And um, I've never heard him preach a bad sermon, and I'm not trying to jinx you. <laughs> he is an excellent preacher, and we're just so grateful to have him. So, Jason, come and lead us. Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. It says, After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he highly valued and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people. And it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them, but when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd that had followed him, Jesus said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave was in good health. This is the word of God for we, the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I was preparing for the message today, I found some some quotes about faith. And I titled this message today, Unlikely Faith, from this text in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7. But these quotes, these aren't, these aren't quotes from, from me. These are quotes that I found online, some anonymous sources. But I want to read a few of them to you. It says, Faith allows God to do for us and with us what we could never do alone. Faith is deaf to doubt, dumb to discouragement, blind to impossibilities, and know nothing but success in God. Walking by faith means being prepared to trust where we are not permitted to see. And then lastly, my favorite one, is faith is not believing that God can, it is knowing that God will. Amen? Faith is not believing that God can, it is knowing that God will. Now we know that, that Scripture reminds us in Hebrews that, that Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith. And it was Jesus who once marveled at this faith in this particular man, and it's the only instance that the gospel records uh, record such a response from Jesus. And when we, we think about this, we ask ourselves, well, who was this guy that Jesus marveled at his faith? Was he a, a rabbi? No. Was he a, a disciple? No. Was he a, a religious teacher? No. He was a Roman soldier, an enemy of Israel. Jesus had just walked down from the, the brow of the low mountainside outside of Capernaum. 
He had just delivered what was would become the most famous sermon in history. And when he entered into the town, he was met by a small delegation of Jewish elders. And they had an urgent request for Jesus. That there was this Roman centurion whose, whose slave was so sick that he was expected to die in a very short amount of time. The centurion had asked these elders to, to go to Jesus on his behalf to see if Jesus may be willing to come and heal his servant. Now when we look at this in the story, we realize that, that this was very, very unusual. Because Jewish leaders were not in the habit of being very fond of Roman soldiers. And so kind of feeling the obvious awkwardness here, one of the elders quickly speaks up and he says, he is worthy to have you do this for him. For he loves our people and he is the one who built us our synagogue. Then that makes the story even more unusual. Because Roman soldiers were not in the habit of being very fond of the Jewish people. So Jesus sets off with them to go to the centurion's home. And he had just preached about loving one's enemies, right? So this was a time for him to to encourage that someone who was an enemy of Israel was asking for help, and Jesus goes. But as they got closer... To the centurion's home, another group of friends comes out and catches them along the road. And a representative in the group stepped over to Jesus and said very respectfully, he said, I have a message from our Roman soldier. He says, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. But only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I am also a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. Knowing that that Jesus, just like him, to these individuals, could speak the word, and those people would do it, he knew that Jesus could speak the words, and this man would be healed. And I can just imagine, this isn't in Scripture, this is one of those Jason Elmore stories, but I can just imagine Jesus thinking about his words. I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I could just see Jesus kind of nod his head and maybe even laugh with a chuckle that this man, a Roman soldier representative of of Israel's enemy understood what even the Jewish elders didn't yet grasp. And that was faith. It was a marvel to Jesus. He looked back at the friend and to the elders and he turned around and he looks at the disciples and this crowd of people that was now following him down the mountain and he said loud enough, the scripture tells us, for everyone to hear, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Not even in Israel have I found such faith. Now, in both Luke's gospel and the gospel of Matthew, They use the Greek word here, thaumadzo, which is translated into marveled or amazed to describe Jesus' response to this Roman soldier's faith. There's only one other time that it's used to describe Jesus' response to somebody else's faith, and that's in Mark chapter 6. And he actually is marveling at the lack of faith in the people of Nazareth where he grew up. This centurion was one of the most unlikely persons to amaze Jesus. He was a Gentile, more than likely had a pagan upbringing. He was a Roman that was was stationed in Palestine to subject the Jews to the emperor's rule. As a Roman soldier, he was a man of war. And he achieved this rank of centurion by distinguishing himself above others in the brutal Roman military. 
That's not exactly the, the resume that you would expect for becoming one of the, the Scripture's great heroes of the faith, was it? So what is it that happened to this man? Scripture doesn't tell us. All we know is there he is in Capernaum, a miracle of God's marvelous grace. And he's a, a first fruit and a, and a foreshadow of what Jesus had come to bring about in this world anyway. He was a living illustration that, that many would come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven as written in the Gospel of Matthew. He is also a reminder to us that man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, as written in 1 Samuel. Now, I think that we will all be surprised someday when Jesus doles out those crowns to us because most of the people that are, were great among us probably are living in obscurity. Jesus is not as impressed with, with titles or degrees and achievements as we are. You see, Jesus is impressed with those who really do humbly believe in Him. Billy Graham was once quoted as saying, God will not reward fruitfulness, God will reward faithfulness. Mother Teresa says, I'm not called to be successful, I'm called to be faithful. The centurion was one who was full of great faith. And today what I want to do is I want to discuss three things that this great faith uh, he embraced that you and I can also embrace. Now I will tell you that, that I almost had four points for this sermon. Then I thought, well, they may think I'm switching denominations if I did a four-point and not three-point sermon. So I'm going to be a good Methodist and stick with our three points today. The first one is, is a person with great faith will have great compassion. I sat at a wedding table last night for a, uh, at the reception of a wedding that I had just officiated, and I sat with one of the family members, and they asked me, do you think the world is lacking compassion these days? And I said, amen, absolutely. As Christians, we need to have that compassion in our hearts. You see, compassion has been defined as your pain in my heart. Amen? Your pain in my heart. And our text today shares the centurion's servant that was dear to him. And the word dear here in the Greek is entomos, and it means valuable or precious. Great faith cares deeply about people. You see, when we have great faith, we will be compassionate to others. There's a, a great story of, a, of an older uh, lady that was, always went to the, the local branch of the post office um, in her town because she always said the, the postal employees there were just so very friendly. And she was there one day to, to buy stamps just before Christmas. And you know that if you go to the post office just before Christmas, you're in for a rude awakening, right? It was a long line, and everything was going on. And somebody told her, they said, ma'am, you realize that you don't have to wait in this long line just to get stamps. You can go over to the stamp machine in the lobby and get your stamps there. And she said, oh, yeah. She said, I know. She said, but that stamp machine won't ask me about my arthritis. Amen? You see, you and I, we want others to care about us. We want others to care about us. And you and I, as Christians, should have compassion flowing from our hearts to others simply because of the compassion that Jesus has shown to us in our time of need. Now, this word compassion is actually derived from two Latin words, pati and cum. And it means to suffer with. To suffer with. Compassion calls us to be with people in their time of need. 
And it's that part of the, the spiritual life which takes us outside of ourselves and brings us into a caring relationship with others. And I probably say this almost every week during a sermon. It is all about relationships. Amen? It is all about relationships. And compassion begins in the heart of God. It's in the nature of the one who is chosen to be with us. The creation stories in Genesis reveal a God who walks and talks with Adam and Eve, even providing for them after their rebellion. The deliverance stories in Exodus portray a God who sees the affliction of his people and comes to their rescue. And then the, the climax of God's compassion, and we're getting ready uh, to go into the season of Advent, Emmanuel, God with us. The incarnation of of Jesus, the Word made flesh, dwelling among us, is the ultimate climax of God's compassion for you and for me. God wants us living with a sensitivity that discerns burdened and confused people and then to help them. Not just acknowledge that they're having issues, but to help them. That's what compassion does. Compassion is action. Compassion is a verb to go and do something. It gets involved, and it sometimes it gets involved at a risk, but we do it because of Jesus. Now, the folks from Asbury here know that, that my favorite movie of all time, and I still think it should be everybody's favorite movie of all time, is Forrest Gump. Love that movie. I love Tom Hanks in that movie. And there's a, a scene there that I think is a good illustration for us. At the beginning, Forrest says that it's funny how you remember some things. He said, I do remember the first bus ride on the first day of school very well. Now, you remember Forrest is sitting on the, the tree stump as this big yellow school bus comes and approaches. And the mother encourages him to do well in school. And the lonely and frightened boy goes and gets on, his, uh, on the bus with those big silver braces on his legs onto this big gigantic yellow bus. And as he walks down the aisle and he looks to, to sit beside someone, the little boy says, seat's taken. That's my Forrest Gump voice. Did you hear that? Seat's taken. And then he walks on and again, Somebody else says to it. He walks on looking for a friendly face. You can't sit here. And on and on. And it perfectly describes the world that we live in. You see, we live in a world that doesn't show much compassion to each other anymore. Especially those who we may consider different. We have to realize right now the world is trying to get on the bus. They are looking for a place to sit. They are looking for compassion and kindness in our world. And in the movie, as it continues, Forrest says, you know it's funny what a man, young man recollects. He said, I don't recall what I got my, for my first Christmas, and I don't know what, uh, when I went on my first outdoor picnic, but I do remember the first time that I heard the sweetest voice in the whole wide world. And that's when little Jenny says, you can sit here if you want. And as she invited Forrest to sit beside her, Forrest says, I have never seen anything so beautiful in my life. She was like an angel. You see, God bids us to extend that same invitation to everyone, regardless of who they are, regardless of what they look like, regardless of who they love, regardless, especially this week, after who they voted for, where they've wandered, what might handicap them, we are called to extend that same invitation to everyone. You and I, as Christians, can be the sweetest voice in the whole wide world. Or we can shake our head and say in so many words, this seat's taken. You see, great faith is compassionate. That's number one. Number two, great faith is humble. Great faith is humble. The centurion sent the message to Jesus by the way of synagogue elders. 
And it would appear that the reason being, the centurion didn't consider himself worthy to receive such a guest as Jesus in his home. You see, if this centurion was able to to build a synagogue, it was very likely that he was a man of power. He was a man of wealth and a man of means. And powerful and rich and self-sufficient people are, are rarely humble. Amen? But he goes to Jesus. He goes to Jesus in his time of need. Jesus is his first resort. The great Baptist evangelist Vance Havner related this story of an elderly lady who was was greatly disturbed by the many troubles that she was having in her life. Some of them were real. Some of them were, were made up. And finally, she was told in a gentle way by her family, they said, Grandma, we've done everything we can do for you. You're just going to have to trust God for the rest. And poor Grandma gets a look on her face of of utter despair, and she says, oh dear, has it come to that? You see, Habner commented, he said, you know what, it always comes to that, amen? Amen. So we, we might as well begin with that. Have Jesus as your first resort. There's some people in our world, and I'm sure you know them, that come to Jesus as the last resort when all of their, what they believe is their abilities, have failed them. They come to Jesus. Once we've exhausted all other possibilities, we are forced to to try God, right? Now this Roman, this, this man of great power, wealth, and authority, comes in humility to Jesus for help. Thomas Akempis once said, Always take the lowest place, and the highest will be given to you. For high structures require a solid foundation. The greatest in the judgment of God are the least in their own opinion. The more worthy they are, the more humility will be seen in them. Do you know some folks that have a high opinion of themselves? Amen. We have to have Jesus first. People of great faith turn to Jesus first. This man with extraordinary love, extraordinary compassion, and extraordinary humility turns to Jesus first. So I ask you this morning, where is it that you turn in your moment of crisis? Do you try to do things by yourself with your your knowledge and your strength and your abilities? Or do you turn to God and realize that those knowledge and strength and abilities aren't yours in the first place? A.W. Tozer once wrote, If our faith is to have a firm foundation, we must be convinced beyond any possible doubt that God is altogether worthy of our trust. Great faith is compassionate. Great faith is humble. And then lastly, great faith faith focuses on Jesus. A few years ago, when I was still working for for Chesterfield County Fire and EMS, uh, some of my my colleagues and myself, we got together and we worked on a a public safety announcement about distracted driving. And you may realize, uh, or you may remember that um, a few years ago, we had a, a, a terrible issue with people running into the rear of our fire trucks and ambulances and police cars uh, around town in all of our uh, Richmond, Henrico, Chesterfield, Hanover. Now, I could get on a soapbox and talk about how how in the world do you not see all the flashing lights, but I won't do that today. But we had this issue that was going on, so some of my colleagues, we got together and we uh, wanted to do this PSA about distracted driving. And the theme for the PSA was, where is your focus? And we made these, these graphics, we took these pictures, and uh, the, the, the basis around it was people were looking on their phones, and that's where their, their focus was, which meant that uh, the firefighters and police officers that they, uh, we had in the picture uh, were all blurred out, and that wasn't their focus. 
So we wanted people to, to realize that their focus needed to be on their driving and not something else. And, and I'll ask you a question in kind of the same light is uh, a, with a little bit of a twist. It says, where is your focus today spiritually? When your focus is, is on something other than Jesus, it's easy to become distracted, isn't it? It is easy to become distracted. In some dog obedience trainings, uh, they place a, a dog at one end of the room and they place its, its owner or its master at the other end of the room. And then in the middle, they play, uh, put a plate of food right there in the middle. And the master will call the dog, and if the dog sees that food, it's a goner, right? That's where it's going to. Kind of sounds like me, amen? When I see that food, I'm not looking at anything else. But if they look at the master, then it goes directly to the master. See, instead of, uh, instead of us focusing on Jesus, sometimes... We like to focus on what's right in front of us, not looking at the, at the big picture. But I promise you, you need to keep your eyes on the master so you won't get distracted. Get your mind off of the circumstances and all of the problems and focus on God's goodness to you in the past, to God's closeness to you in the present and his, his power to help you in the future. Do what Jonah did as Jonah sat in the belly of the great fish. He says, when I lost all hope, I turned my thoughts once more to the Lord. And if you find yourself at a point where you've, you've lost hope or you've, you've lost faith and you think you're, you're never going to get a job or you're never going to get married or, or have kids or uh, you're not going to get over this illness, turn your thoughts to God and focus on Jesus. Turn your thoughts to God and focus on Jesus because great faith are ones who focus their lives on Jesus Christ. John Patton was, was translating a, a Bible for a, a South Seas Island tribe, some, some natives of that area. And he was trying to, to write uh, the, the scripture in their language, something that they could understand. And he discovered that in their language, they had no word for trust or no word for faith. And he thought it was odd. He thought to himself, how in the world am I going to translate the Bible without having a word for trust or faith? And he was at a sticking point. But one day, there was one of the, the natives who, who had been running hard, Working all day, he came into the missionary's house and he flopped himself down into this chair and he said, ah, it is so good to rest my whole weight on this chair. And that's when it hit him. He said, you know, I will translate faith as resting one's whole weight on God. Resting one's whole weight on God. Where are you resting your weight at today? You see, the centurion found a place to rest his, and that was in Jesus Christ. That great faith is compassionate. Great faith is, is humble. And great faith focuses on Jesus Christ. Have you found a place to rest your whole weight today? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, O oh merciful Father, we thank you for the glorious day before us. Dear God, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Asbury, and that we may come to worship together in this place. We ask for prayers of protection, comfort, and peace upon Pastor Jason, and we thank you for anointing him to bring us this word this morning. Dear God, we thank you for 
your peace amidst the craziness and chaos of this fallen world. May our unlikely faith remain uncompromised in you and only you. May our unlikely faith bring before us unlikely ways to serve you that we might lead those to unlikely blessings and bring glory to your name in all things. As the words of the hymn we sang to praise you this morning resounds, may your spirit fall afresh on your people. May we seek to always make ourselves available to you that you might melt us, mold us, and ultimately use us to further your glorious kingdom. May we know that a life devoted to you stands on the pillars of compassion and living humbly and fixing our eyes on you. You see, Lord, you are not and never should be our last resort, but always our first resort. Not our plan B, but our plan A. Not seeking you in an act of desperation, but rather seeking you in an act of faithfulness. Beautiful, unwavering, unlikely faith. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on your people. It is in your glorious name we pray. Amen. Between Jason's preaching and Ron's prayer, I don't know if you can take it. In. Can you take any more? I want you to open your hymnals to page 12. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sin and who seek to live in peace with God and one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. Let us pray together silently. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all of the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of your suffering and death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and says, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by your precious blood, by your Spirit. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, all honor, all glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as the children of God, let us say with confidence the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against them. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to ask if the ushers will come and lead us. You're going to come and you're going to um, take the little cup and the little juice. You're going to go back to your seats, and we will do it together, but the ushers will lead us. Uh, can we serve Linda and Janet first?
and yeah. I mean, if you're able, if you're able. So it's two tabs. So the first tab we're going to pull is going to be the little wafer. So let us take the body of Christ together. You're going to take the little wafer. And try not to get the juice on your neighbor. And let us drink together. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself for us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves to others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Remain standing and open the faith we sing the little black book to 2151. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Amen. This is a wonderful time in the life of the church where we get to participate through the giving of our tithes and offerings. I want you to know that your tithes and your offerings go so that we can further the kingdom of God. So grateful for our live stream. And I know you're grateful for your live stream where folks are able to give. But we just thank God for blessing all of you as cheerful givers. And we're going to have a prayer. And you will give your offering as you leave. There should be two baskets in the back, one that says Asbury, and one will be for Providence. Okay, so you will give your offering as you leave. Okay, so we don't want to take away God's opportunity to allow you to participate in worship through the giving of your tithes and your offerings. So let us pray. Most gracious God, you're so good to us. One, to give us the gift of each other. So grateful that you are with Providence and Asbury. And you show your faithfulness to us that you have been with us low these many years. Names and faces have changed, but your spirit is the same. You are so faithful, Lord. Your track record is amazing. 
So help us in this moment to be faithful to you. To give as we can. Oh Lord, maybe you're calling on some of us even in this moment to give sacrificially. We pray a blessing upon Asbury Church and upon Providence Church. Have your way this day and always. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want you to stand for your benediction. I'm going to ask Jason to come and and give us our benediction. And after he does, I want you to take a seat and the ushers will come so that we can leave following our protocols. Um, sweetheart, I said a whole lot of things about you before you showed up. <laughs> and I did ask if somebody was willing to drive me home and let me sleep on their couch. But you're here. Um, my wife on Monday will be turning 50 and what a gorgeous 50 she is. Amen. Would you celebrate with me? I'm just trying to get back into the house. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All right. But we're so Adam <laughs> close. <laughs> so grateful for, for all of you. Shirley Collins is celebrating a birthday also, sweetheart. And Mae Clark is celebrating um, a birthday. I pray today something said has been meaningful for you. And Jason, the Lord has used you well Thank you. on this day. And Ron, the Lord has used you well on this day. And can we celebrate Linda Collins and Janet Watts this morning? And Sarah is hoping to come back next weekend, the 14th. And so let's give God a hand clap of praise for her too. That's the goal. That's the goal. That's the goal. So Jason, would you give us our benediction? Absolutely. Faith is one of those words that, uh, that we use a lot, that we talk about a lot. Uh, for example, sometimes it doesn't mean quite as much as it does in, in Scripture, but I had all kinds of faith that my Red Sox were going to win the World Series, but that didn't happen. Amen. Uh, oh, look. I didn't know Ron was a Yankees fan, but we're sharing. See what the Lord can do, it can bring anybody together. Amen. But that word faith is, is not believing that God can, but knowing that God will. Go with that knowledge today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.